Welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth. This is the podcast where we talk about Lost. This week we are watching uh, the season one episode Raised by Another. It's about Claire, a little bit of Ethan. Everyone's favorite psychic, Richard Malkin. But speaking of Ethan, we've got uh, part one of a two-part interview with William Maitfather, who plays uh, Ethan Rom, and we asked him about how creepy he is. <laughs> Very excited to share it with you. Let's get into it. So as always, we start with hot takes. Yeah. What do you have as a hot take today? I can start. Um, so I haven't watched Lost in like, I don't know, five, six years. And I was just really pissed about the fact that nobody believes Claire. Like, mm. so so initially you get in, in her flashback, her boyfriend just treating her like shit and accusing her of like not taking her birth control correctly or like making it up or Which... not doing the pregnancy test correctly and just not trusting her to be a responsible, independent woman. And then in the present, you get Jack repeatedly um, downplaying what she says is real for reasons that are understandable. I think lots of doctors do that. But of course, we've read, I, I read an article like six months ago about how doctors routinely downgrade women's pain, pain estimates. Like mm. when they ask women to estimate what kind of pain they're in and they say eight, they assume it must really be a six because she must be exaggerating. Um, That's super and weird. Yeah. And it's the, just there's so many like pervasive issues that come with like just not believing women when they talk about the things that have happened to them that I've just been thinking about a lot lately and they all seem to come to fruition in this episode I don't know if the writers meant this meant that given that this was written 13 14 years ago and I don't think all of this was like quite so in the zeitgeist but I was that's what I was thinking about so in principle I agree with all of that mm -hmm. and certainly the part about Thomas who is a dick horrible actually my hot take is just about what a shit he is yeah um, which we can get to. But I, I I guess I do think that coming from Jack's perspective, just thinking this through, if he, you know, Claire says that she was, she did have a nightmare the mm -hmm. night before. And she did sleepwalk. And she did sleepwalk and scream. Mm -hmm. And she claims that she was stabbed in the you know stomach mm -hmm. or with a needle or something while they're in the cave surrounded by just mm -hmm. the people from the plane. So I guess if I'm Jack in this situation and I'm a doctor, yeah. I'm probably also thinking exactly what he is, which is there's no way that this could have happened. Yeah. And so I and I was thinking about that conversation that he has with her where he mm -hmm. tries to get her to take the, the anti-anxiety meds yeah. or whatever. And clearly watching that conversation, it feels like, yeah, Jack really did this badly and you know, screwed this up and, mm -hmm. and should have done it better. But I also found myself thinking like, gee... What could Jack have done yeah. better or differently there? And I don't really know the answer yeah. to that. Yeah, well, and Jack's perspective, of course, is like, holy shit, she's going to have a baby, and we're on this island, and we have nothing. And presumably Jack kind of knows how to deliver a baby, but he's not, you know, he's not an OBGYN. Right. It's not his area of expertise. Um, so I think he's just nervous about knowing he's going to have to deal with that as well. Yeah. And, and definitely wants to take every necessary precaution. Um, <laughs> yeah, as I, as I foreshadowed, I just... Thomas is so What bad. a dick! What, oh a, what just a terrible, terrible person. I feel like most of my hot takes are just which character I thought was the <laughs> shittiest that episode, like last week with Michael. Um, but no, my, the moment where... I think the most brutal moment of them all was the one where... Where Claire thinks he's upset because he she thinks that you know he thinks that she ate all the potato chips. Oh yeah. And you can already and in that moment you see that Ugh. look on his face where it's gonna be like no I'm leaving you. Mm -hmm. Claire, I can't do this. Do what? Do you have a bad day? This isn't working. A bad moment. Yeah. Yeah, grade A asshole. My gosh, and he convinced her that they should go I for know. it. I know! What the hell? I know! Ugh, okay. Jesus. So we also received a hot take this week in response to uh, some discussion that we had with Andrea Gabriel, who plays Nadia on, on last week's episode. Let's listen in. Hey, this is Michael Lucero. I've been listening to the podcast for a, a long time. I'm a huge fan. Um, I loved the episode on Solitary. One thing I would say, though, uh, I don't. I disagree that the idea that Shannon uh, ends up with uh, Saeed and the church and the flash sideways uh, that that kind of cheapens or undermines his relationship with Nadia. I don't think that that's even what's what's going on in the first place. Um, a friend of mine told me right after the uh, finale first aired 
uh, and this has affected the way that I look at it ever since, that the flash sideways world is not really the afterlife at all. It's just uh, a place, as Christian Shepherd says, that uh, all of them created because they needed to find each other one last time before moving on. And what they, the light that they go into in the church at the end, that's actually the afterlife, whatever that is. So I don't think that it invalidates um, Saeed and Nadia's uh, story at all to have him um, being with Shannon in that church. And Nadia and Saeed probably meet up after that in whatever the afterlife uh, ends up being. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I really have nothing to add, Michael. I think that was well-reasoned and <laughs> a, good, a good way of looking at things. Yeah, we, we agree with you. Thanks yeah, for call. thanks for calling. Call again. Let's get into Claire, though. I, I was interested in, in Claire saying that she doesn't want to be rescued. I, yeah. Which I liked a lot, but also then found myself wondering at the end, like, wait, did Charlie just rescue her? And what? I, I guess I didn't know how to feel about her and Charlie's interactions this episode. Well, so Charlie is being... A little overbearing. Okay. Right? Um, he's trying to be a friend. He's trying to be supportive. He's trying to be there for her. But he's also, like, not listening to her when she says she wants him to leave her alone. Yeah. Um, which is a thing that you should do when someone says they want. I mean, the thing about, like, her walking through the forest alone, valid. Probably should not be trapsing around the island alone when someone tried to attack you the previous night. But, um... Yeah, he repeatedly keeps showing up when she's made it clear that she, she she doesn't want him to show up. You're right. And it's... Like, I want to sympathize with Charlie. Like, he seems like he's trying to, you know... He's trying to do the right his, thing. Yeah, but you're right. He's not really listening. He's not really respecting her. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of doing the same thing that Jack and Ty... He's not believing her when she says, like, I don't want you here. Yeah. Um, he just won't take her at her word. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel for Claire nowadays and maybe this is just because like i'm older than i was the first time i watched lost but like i she may be more not more than anybody but like in her own particular way really thrown for a loop by this whole trapped on the desert island thing like she has already gone through so much clearly over the last few months in deciding whether to keep to keep to give up the baby then to keep it then to give it you know back and back back and forth and back and forth and finally she has made her decision and it's the last possible decision she can make because she's flying to L.A. to have the baby. And then now she's on the island. And I don't know. She just really, like, that's some serious whiplash. Um, maybe more than anybody we've met has had to deal with yet. Um, no, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you have that perspective on Claire just because I, I always have been sort of uncertain how to feel about mm -hmm. her and never... Um, she, I mean, she's not one of my favorite characters. Mm -hmm. I always kind of wish the writers had done a little bit more with her rather she feels like a plot device a lot of the time yeah. she gets kidnapped yeah. she loses her memory she gets the sickness and goes crazy mm -hmm. she has to find her baby and that's true just all of these these things keep happening to her instead of her doing things that are interesting and which is yeah that's a good point i mean it, it's a little sad and I, I just feel like there's a little bit of a missed opportunity well anyway you said you wanted let's come back to claire you said you wanted to bring up the psychic let's talk well, let's get into that okay is that why you didn't want to do my reading last time? No, no. I saw something, sort of a blurry thing. And blurry's bad? Blurry's bad. My question is just, is he a real psychic? Yeah. Which I'm still, you know, all of these years later after watching this, still kind of wondering about. I was wondering about that too, and I think it would be certainly consistent with, like, the lore of the show that he could be a psychic. Or yes. that he could have some kind of abilities right um yeah and the whole thing about you know did you know did he know that the plane was going to crash mm -hmm. and that makes a certain amount of sense yeah but there was an episode in season two he shows up one more time yeah and it's like a mr echo flashback mm -hmm. and the the moral of that story is that he says to mr echo look i'm not a real I'm psychic a i'm a hoax yeah which like maybe they're just you know trying to mess with us but what I, I was hearing th what, through that what what's basically the the climax of Malcolm's character when he's insisting your goodness must be an influence in the life of this child there's no happy life for this child without you was trying to read that knowing that Claire does not ultimately raise her son mm -hmm. and trying to re read it in in terms of him speaking about her life because mm -hmm. 
I think there's an argument to be made that so so we know Claire gets the sickness, right? She doesn't just lose her mind. Right. She gets the monster sickness. But if Aaron had stayed with her, is there a possibility that could have been avoided? Could Claire have had a different end if Kate hmm. did not in fact take him off the island when she did? Right, because that did kind of make her crazy. Is it possible to read Malcolm's warning as you know if, if your child gets taken away there's no happy life for you oh that's super interesting you know right because I guess even though she gets you know quote unquote infected it, it seems kind of like the, the gateway drug to that in a way is the loss of her child right. because when, when they get back that is what is you know is her motivated. That's the thing she's latched like, onto. Yeah. Right, she's running around the jungle with a rifle looking for Aaron. So the, yeah, the thing that I always come back to about Claire is like, is she naive or not? And is she, like, to what degree does she need all this protection that people right. are trying to offer her? And this is kind of the same thing I objected to at the beginning. Like, she, everyone is going out of their way to like make sure she's healthy and okay but not not protected a in the way that she actually needs to be from ethan yes <laughs> and and be like not actually listening to her when she's i don't know not believing her not taking her at her word because they dismiss her in, do you know what i mean i do and i don't quite know what to do with that because i don't think claire has given us any reason to think that she's not self-sufficient like in the way that shannon has right, right? or that other characters have shown like or Boone, you know, <laughs> they'd be dead without help. Um, she probably wouldn't be. Well, I, this is kind of a, maybe a different approach to the question that I posed before. You know, she keeps saying, she, you know, I don't need to be rescued, right. I don't need to be rescued. And I, like, really want to believe that's the case, and I, you know, I like that that's her attitude. Mm -hmm. She is eight and a half months pregnant on her own... On, an on island, a desert island, yeah. With no medical Chocolate. care, and she's having bad nightmares. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's... Mentally, she's she's not in great shape. I mean, she seems to be doing okay, mm -hmm. but, like, understandably, she's, right. you know, going through some stuff. So I, I don't want to be in a position of saying, like, maybe she needs to be rescued, because I don't mm -hmm. think that's the case, but the protection that everyone is trying to or wants to give her, that they feel like they need to... Hmm. Maybe there's some... At least in everyone's... Maybe there's some justification for that. Yeah, no, I certainly think yeah. there is. And I think it, she's eight and a half months pregnant. Like, yeah. yes, you go get her food. Yes, you get her water. But like, right. Um, but, like, yeah, but, but nobody just... But nobody seems to be giving her what she needs. Nobody really seems right. to respect her. Yeah. Because right, Jack just wants to give her pills. Right. And Charlie just... Just wants her attention. Yeah. And... Well, Ethan just wants her baby. Oof. Um... But nobody actually seems... And this is also what we see in Claire's life prior to being on the island, is that nobody really respects her. Right. Uh, she just... I mean, Thomas especially, because he's a shithead. But, like, you know, we, we get snippets of, like, she hasn't told her mom yet because her mom will be... Her mom's upset. already basically disowned her, Thomas. Yeah, says. and her, her dad's not in her life. And, like, there's all this other stuff. Um, I do have one thing in hindsight, which yeah. is the manifest... Brilliant idea. That was on my list also. Brilliant. Thank you. I, like, and also shout out to Hurley for once again taking care of like a basic need of the group. Like, <laughs> like he, had, last he had the golf the course, ball. he had, like Hurley is very much aware of like the needs on the ground, right? Like we don't know he who is. people are. We're all going crazy. And when he <laughs> tries to explain it to Jack, Jack like doesn't get it. I'm not following you. Look, if I was a cop and some woman got attacked, we'd canvas, right? Knock on doors, find witnesses. We don't even have doors. Really, you're not helping me understand where Look, you're... we don't know who's living here and who's still at the beach. I mean, we didn't even know each other. Yeah. Which, it, and it seems, maybe this is just the retrospect of us knowing what it leads to, but mm -hmm. it seems pretty obvious if you'd suggest take a census, find out who everyone is. is that but yeah, good idea, really. Right, because it is a relatively big group of people. Like, it's not 10 people, it's 48. I was just gonna, <laughs> the moment at the end. I mean, that, that last sequence of this episode. Oh, where Ethan comes out of the forest. Seriously. Holy shit. I, I love that whole sequence. Like, I remembered Ethan coming out yeah. of the forest, but I, I had forgotten that it leads in with, like, Saeed rushes into the, mm. the caves and he's, you know, 
beat up and he says that the French woman is right. there and, and then Hurley runs in, there's another guy, there's another guy, he wasn't on the plane. He wasn't on the manifest. And then, and then you get to Ethan. Well, but even before that happens, Charlie encounters Ethan on the path and sends right. him to go get Jack. Right. Or, you know, quote unquote, sends him, which is also terrifying. And Were you terrified in that moment? No, but knowing in hindsight. Oh, yeah, yeah, in hindsight. Um, yeah. I, I asked, and you'll get this in the interview, but I, I asked William, William Maypother about how he did that face at the end. Oh, the... And, I'm making, I'm making a face, which is no good for podcasting, <laughs> but yes, that face. Yeah, he... You'll want to hear what he has to say about that face. Oh, I can't wait. Let's, uh, let's roll the tape. So I'm here with William Maypother, <clears throat> who played Ethan Rom on Lost. Uh, William, thanks very much for, uh, for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. How, uh, how did you get cast as Ethan? It's fall of 2004, and uh, I'll give you, I'll try not to make this too long. It's fall of 2004, and a bunch of my friends from college, we wanted to get together for a reunion. We had tried two years earlier in the fall of 2002. I got a job at the last minute, and I had organized everything. I had to drop out and caught lots of abuse. So it's now fall of 2004, I think September, and I had organized it again. And on a Thursday morning, I was supposed to fly east to Chicago and join them all. And Wednesday morning, I think, I got a call from my agent that said, I have gotten you an offer for two episodes of a new show. I said, what is it? Lost. She said, Lost. I said, I've never heard of it. She said, it premieres tonight. Well, I'm like any working actor. I can't say no to an offer for anything without having to audition for it, and especially two episodes. And so I had to break the news to my friends, and I caught abuse all afternoon. And so the next morning, instead of flying east to Chicago, I flew from L.A. west to Honolulu. And when I got up and went to the airport that morning, um, the show was immediately hit right out of the gate. And I landed, and they took me right to the set and started shooting. And they didn't even have time to find me the right shoes. So they literally bought the sneakers off my, shoe, off my feet, which is why Ethan wears New Balance. <laughs> <laughs> And I was told that I was cast without having to audition because J.J. Abrams remembered me from my role in the movie In the Bedroom with Marissa Tomei and Sissy Spacek, which had gotten some Oscar nominations uh, a year earlier, and said, oh, that guy's perfect. Just go ahead and hire him. So one of the things that I, uh, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, I just one of the things I found interesting about your role uh, in the first season of Lost Anyway, uh, you know, I went back and I watched those episodes, and they had these... You know, really strong recollections of, of your character and you know Ethan's very intimidating and, and kind of frightening but you hardly uh, you know hardly appear you hardly have any speaking lines in terms of what airs and you only appear in a couple of scenes but obviously you make a really big impression um, how did you do that how did you uh, you know sort of make Ethan so scary with sort of the the little time and, and dialogue you had to work with well I guess that's uh, I should start off with a thank you I guess. Um, <laughs> well, you should but, talk to, I, I wish my co-host Rosalie was here when I, I told her we were going to talk to you and, and she was a little bit terrified still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, I used to get that a lot. Um, uh, well, uh, the first thing I'll say is just as with everything in a screen story, whether it's television or film, it's never the actor alone. I read uh, the two episodes on my flight over to Honolulu and when I got toward the end of that first episode I'm in, uh, and it said, the next to last page said, I think Hurley running into Jack and saying, he's not on the manifest, he's not on the manifest. And I thought, holy cow. Uh, you and the writers, else. The writers have constructed a reveal below people's socks off. So as soon as I landed, I, had called, I remember calling my agents and saying, this is a fantastic role. So the first thing I'll do is give a nod to the creators and the writers because they did a hell of a job in setting it up. So anyone, so my, I guess the first part of my answer is anyone who appeared in that role was going to be a little bit larger than life just because of the way uh, the build had occurred and their role in the ensemble. Uh, and I think the audience so clearly identified with the characters that any outsider was going to be a little bit scary. And the first episode I'm in, I think I'm gathering papayas and I'm a nice guy. That may have been, or that may have been the second episode. I think the first one was when the golf course episode and I dropped some clubs. The second one I'm gathering papayas and we talk about Ontario, if I recall correctly. And then, um, and then uh, they discover I'm not on the manifest and uh, Charlie is there with Claire. And uh, we had uh, a director who had an interesting style. We were out in the jungle 
and they had a wide shot, which meant that what they call uh, video village, which is where the monitors are and the director sits and everybody, had to be far away from the actors because of, they couldn't be seen in the shot. And we were running out of light. So instead of doing a series of takes, they, the director was hollering um, uh, direction at me, and they just kept rolling. So that she would say, okay, now do it like you're an alien. Mm. Now do it like you're a monster. Now do it like you're sympathetic. Now do it. And so it was all in one long take. And that's specifically the shot of when the Charlie and Claire are looking at each other and they look up and I'm, I'm there about 30 feet away or something. And I, I, I guess the final part of my answer is I, I look at that now – on screen, or I haven't in a long time, but when I did, and the expression on my face, <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. It scared me, but it looked like this guy is up to no damn good. I don't even know what's happening between that guy's ears. And that's, so I felt the same way. Now, interestingly, the rest of that scene is cut off. Right, because all, all you say on the air is, hello there, right? I mean, that's the only line that gets kept. Oh, really? Is that I, it? I think well, that's it. So what else that. is there? Okay. Well, so... Uh, it, the way we shot it, and this is what I recall, is that after I said that, then the whispering starts around in the jungle. And Charlie and Claire look around for a second, uh, around them. And when they turn back in front, I'm suddenly standing in front of them. And I've somehow teleported myself like 30 feet in a second and a half. Oh, wow. And Charlie startles and looks at me and says something like, you didn't go get the wood, or I think I had some, ta he'd given me some task or something. And... Uh, I ignored him, and I looked at Claire, and I said, it's going to be okay. Hmm. Something like that. And uh, he freaked out, and she gets, you know, gets nervous. But I think the producers felt that the look on my face and the distance was a good point to, to, to stop the scene. And based on the audience's reaction, I, obviously they, <laughs> they seemed to have yeah. made the right decision. <laughs> yeah, no, you're so right. I, think, I, uh, I can picture exactly the look that you're describing, and I, I also couldn't explain to you exactly what it means but it's 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 something it's it's ambiguous um, and that's a little bit that's a little bit of the sphere of it I think uh, part of it was that it was tough to read and uh, that's a scary thing when you know somebody's looking at you and and you can't identify what their intentions are so when you, when you filmed those episodes in season one I mean did you know anything about Ethan or about the others beyond what was in the pages of those scripts not a lot we landed uh, and they took me right to the set, as I said, and I shot, um, it may have been that scene when we, uh, no, I think it's, uh, it's a scene when, um, when I bring the golf clubs in with, with uh, someone else. And, uh, and then right after that, I went to the producers and I said, well, you got to tell me something about this character. And I kind of insisted that they let me see all the episodes they had shot up to that point. I, so as I said, the first episode had just aired, and I was shooting, I think, episode seven. And I said, you got to let me see two through six so I can understand what this world is. What, what rules does it operate under? And they let me see those, and then I started peppering them with questions about Ethan. And some they were able to answer, and some they didn't. And some of them they were cagey on. Like, they were like, well, he didn't grow up on the island, but he, maybe he did, and this and that. So the bottom line was it wasn't a lot of help uh, pestering them with questions. And I think part of it was that they, were, they, did, they weren't quite sure themselves. Yeah, I think they've mm -hmm. said in Damon specifically uh, uh, that in, in interviews that they knew where they were headed, they just didn't quite know how to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think that they had created this character and they weren't quite sure what they were going to do with him. Right. Which I guess is maybe one of the reasons that, that he turns out uh, and, and you turn out so scary. If, if nobody really even knows, it's, uh, I mean, that just adds to that sort of ambiguity you were talking about. Exactly. Did, exactly. You, did you know at least that there, was a, that there was a group of people that Ethan was a part of, that you weren't just this lone wolf sort of stalking the island? No, I did, no, I did not know that. Wow. I did not know that. And I remember, because um, I watched the show, I was a fan like everyone else, and some time I think in uh, season two or three or something at one point I think it was Juliet after Ethan had been killed she comes over to to the survivors and they ask her something about Ethan and she said Ethan was a surgeon and I hmm. sat up in my living room sofa <laughs> what they never told me that I might have I might have laid in a little bit of a color 
with a surgical past. But um, so my point was there were a few times when I learned things about my character the same time the rest of the audience did. Right. Was it the same when they uh, they went and you saw a little bit of Ethan's childhood and it was a child actor playing him? That was all, all news to you as well? Uh, yeah, that was news to me as wow. well. I, I don't want to leave these early episodes too fast, but just to skip ahead, I mean, did you have any, you know, cause in, the, in the first season when you, you come back a couple episodes later and, and, and Charlie shoots you, uh, did you have any idea that you would be coming back after that? Because I mean, you make another, I think, six or seven or eight appearances in later seasons. Yes. Uh, no, I had no idea. I thought that was it. And, of course, I was very disappointed. But uh, I didn't know that I was going to come back, and I don't think they knew. I think that they used, uh, they used my character as a way to goose up the tension um, uh, a few times for my in later appearances it's because they wanted to throw in a little bit of a scare to the audience and then some yeah. of those are some of my later appearances other later appearances I think were used to flesh out a theme or a storyline or maybe the character himself but because even in the, <laughs> in the scripts of the later episodes uh, I don't know what the language restrictions are on your show you, but you can say whatever it, you want we're, we're I, if I recall correctly and I have the script somewhere Damon would write uh, so and so looks up holy fucking shit it's Ethan Rom in capital <laughs> letters <laughs> which gives you an indication about how and why he was suddenly introducing me at that moment <laughs> Oh man! So that—that that is just exactly the reaction that every fan had in those moments. Yes, so that, that is perfect. So I and so I didn't. Uh, the answer is when Charlie killed me, I had no idea I was coming back. Holy fucking shit! It's Ethan Rome. That's amazing, and also how I felt when Ethan came back. <laughs> yes. That's a hundred percent how I felt when Ethan returned. Every single time. <laughs> yeah, because there were a couple times when he re he reappeared, and then he'd go away for a while, and you'd assume he was gone, and then he'd pop back up. Yeah. I also love that he showed up on the island, and they didn't really tell him why he was there. Yeah. Like, A, they didn't show him, like, what they'd already filmed. They just said, like, hey, man, you're part of this crew. And he knew he, knew he was somebody shady, but didn't know how exactly. Yeah. And it sounds like either they didn't totally know how, or they just didn't want to disclose it which is totally understandable but that's well, pretty funny good to me. for him for asking yeah <laughs> yeah i also yeah. love uh that that scene right at the end of raised by another which we already talked about where ethan finds charlie and claire in the forest and makes that crazy face um that's what he was talking about right yeah he was saying like, yeah, they yeah. shouted do it like an alien do it yeah like which is hilarious what do you think he settled on <sighs> uh I think he kind of looks like what I imagine like a serial killer to look like. Kind of, yeah. Like, he's delighted with what he's stumbled upon, but also maniacal, but also really, like, hungry. Like, oh, it's very scary. Well, I think he described it very well as that part of the scary thing is like, wow, I have no idea what is going on in yeah. this guy's head. Yeah, because we don't. Yeah. Even at this point, we don't. All we know is he's not on the manifest and someone's been attacking Claire. Yes. And we have assumed that it's Ethan, but like, we have, is he just crazy? Is he, you know, we know yeah. nothing of the others, right? And point. I feel like you don't even put that all together until after, you know, bam, lost, episode ends. Um, I think they made the right choice to cut it at that moment yeah. rather than doing the weird Claire's gonna be okay thing, yeah. yeah. Like, that would have been dramatic too, but this mm -hmm. was perfect. Oh, it's so, and it's so much scarier. Like, him, him saying something like, Claire, it's gonna be okay, would have been freaky, but like, this is... Much freakier. Yeah. Props. We will we will have more with William Maypot mm. next week. Talk about some of his his later appearances on the show, and of course his death. Uh, plenty to come. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on the Hatch. You can interact with us on various online platforms. We are at Facebook.com/slash The Hatch Podcast, on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast. Um, I think that's all of the online platforms yeah, that we're on. Yep. Um, rate and review us on iTunes, please, if you if you like the show. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do a better job of keeping this. If not weekly, then as close to it as possible. Yeah, thank you for sticking with us. We've both uh, been dealing with some job stuff and some personal stuff the last couple of months, and we had to take an unplanned hiatus, but we are excited to be back watching Lost. We are, and we hope you are too. Uh, our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. You left out a critical notion. I did. Which is a hot take. Oh, I'm Friends, so long. if you want to call us take. and leave a hot take, we would like nothing more than for you to do that. We I do will... remember the number. Yes. 9546 Dharma. Yes. 9546 D H A R M A. 
Uh, it's an American phone number. If you're out of the country and you don't want to incur any charges, you can record a voice memo and just send it to our Facebook page. That is facebook.com slash podcast. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll play it on the show. Namaste. Namaste.